All right, good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending where you might be. This is session 2-1, which is leading Canadians at the World Radio Sport Team Championship. And we have two presenters with us uh, today. We have Victor Echo 5 Mike X-Ray, Todd Benson, uh, whose interest in radio began as a 13-year-old, listening to far-off AM stations at night. And from there, a gift of a radio with the shortwave bands provided the spark that introduced him to the shortwave broadcast bands, as well as amateur radio. Also with us today is uh, Victor Alpha 2 Echo Whiskey, Gilles Renucci. And Gilles' passion for radio and electronics started when he was 12 years old, leading him to get his first call sign at the age of 17 and graduating as an electronics software engineer at 24. He discovered contesting at engineering school. Professionally, uh, Gilles thanks his technical passion for helping him create several high-tech companies. Since moving to Canada, he's been very involved with the Montreal amateur radio community and has served for three years as the president of the Union Metropolitain de Saint-Félix de Montréal, a major local radio club, and later the president of the West Island Amateur Radio Club. So those are our two presenters. Uh, we welcome both Todd and Jill with us today. Uh, they've both provided us ahead of time with uh, a slide presentation, PowerPoint presentation, and I have that stored locally here. So I will play that from my computer now and when the presentation is over, and it's about 20 minutes, I think, altogether, then we'll open up the room for questions. In the meantime, while the presentation is playing, I, I uh, would request that uh, all of us mute ourselves if we are not muted, just to help uh, control the noise flow on the channel. And if you just allow me just a moment or two to set up my screen sharing, hopefully it'll work, uh, then we'll be ready to go. Before I begin, I'll just ask people if they could just unmute quickly and, and verify that they can see uh, my screen okay? See okay. Perfect, thank you. And hopefully I will also be, oh, one thing I forgot to do, I guess, was uh, to make sure I was sharing the audio as well. So let me begin that again. And I'll click off a couple of important buttons, check boxes before I do this. And now we'll try this again. Uh, can you verify one more time that you can see it okay? See okay. Great, thank you. And I will now hit play. And it might take a second or two for some sound to appear. Uh, I'll be standing by here listening. Uh, if there's any sound issues, let me know. The sound should come through well, though. We did a test yesterday. So uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, allez-y. Good evening. My name is Todd Benson, the E5MX. Sound OK. And I'd like to thank Dave, the 9 Charlie Bravo, for the invitation to present at the annual general meeting. I'm here to tell you about my experience qualifying for WRTC. What is the WRTC? It's the World Radio Sport Team Championship, a gathering of the world's best in radio traffic coming from all over the world using the same playing field, allowing skill to determine the world champions in two person team, 24 hour competition. This is the Olympics of ham radio contesting. WRTC 2022 was awarded to Italy, but COVID-19 got in the way, leading to its postponement until July of 2023. What will WRTC 2022 look like? There'll be 50 teams from around the world who've qualified for their selection area. Canada has two of these spots, North America two, which is Ontario East, including uh, Greenland and St. Pierre, and North America eight, which is Manitoba and West, including the state of Alaska. There's one team of returning champions from WRTC 2018 in Germany. And then in an effort to encourage the next generation of contesters, there's a provision for six youth teams there's also five sponsored teams and a few wildcard teams that the organizers deem worthy for a total of approximately 60 to 65 teams. How have Canadians fared at WRTC? Pretty well, it turns out. Canada has been represented at every RTC going back to the inaugural event in Seattle in 1990. 12 different Canadians have participated over the years, 
and Canadians have finished in the top 10 nine times. With the team of E3EJ and V7ZO won the event in Brazil in 2006. We're going to have some pretty big shoes to fill. So how would I get here? For that, we have to go all the way back to field day, 1984, operating from VE5 Queen Mary, operated from a tent out in the middle of a cow pasture. Here's a picture of the group, including a young V5 Golf Charlie on the right. His son and I are the same age and Gray was instrumental in urging me to pursue my license. The road to that, to that license took another six years, finishing high school and then tech school took priority. And finally, with a slow winter work-wise and much encouragement from BJ, B5FX, I hit the books and learned CW. Finally, in the spring of 1990, I earned my ticket. Like a lot of guys, I started out with wire antennas until we bought our first home. When I put up your typical tribander and wires from a city lot kind of station. And we had an awful lot of fun doing it. We continued to operate field day. There's V5 GC wrecking stuff while I operate from the travel trailer. I continued to make improvements to the station, but over the years, but as many of you are aware, the noise in the city just has relentlessly kept building and growing. So we started looking outside city limits. And in the fall of 2016, we acquired the property that would become the E5 MX 2.0. It was a pretty humble start, just the vertical and a radio set up on a folding table in the pole building run by a generator. But I spent that winter dreaming and planning. And uh, in the summer, we made a trip to Edmonton to pick up a trailer load of aluminum and towers. And we got to work building antennas. Let me tell you, we seriously underestimated the time it would take to build the station. This is my daughter, Shelby, putting the finishing touches on a 15 meter Yagi. Shelby and her husband, Quinn, were the backbone of the project. Not only did they help with antenna construction, they did all the tower work. I can't say enough good about them. This station wouldn't be what it is without their help. Finally, uh, the summer of 2018, we started getting antennas in the air. And uh, we had my dream station ready in time for CQ Worldwide RTTY at the end of September. But because this is Canada, Mother Nature has the final say. I'm happy to report that we passed that test with minimal damage. So that's quick history, but let's get back to WRTC. After having the time of my life and running up some big scores over the winter of 2018-2019, Kerry, the E4EA, reached out wondering about coming for a visit. And after some scheduling back and forth in July, Kerry and Tom, the E3 Charlie X-Ray, from uh, the author from TCA, made the trip out to Saskatchewan. We were joined by Bart, V5 CPU, and Sam, V5 SF. Uh, certainly familiar calls to any of you that have operated the rack events. To tour the station and spend a very enjoyable afternoon of discussion that stretched into a long dinner. But Carrie and Tom had something else on their mind. WRTC qualifying. Throughout the day, they had made their pitch that with the new station, the time was right for me to try and qualify for WRTC. After some, giving it some serious consideration involving more than a couple conversations with Don of E6JY, who I've spent many hours with contesting as a operator, 
either as a guest operator or as part of a multi-op from his station. I decided to take the plunge into trying to qualify for WRTC. One of the best suggestions Don gave me was to reach out to Lee, the E7CC, a five-time WRTC competitor. And he was more than happy to share his knowledge, experience and tips and things to consider. The, not the least of which was a qualifying strategy. The key to our strategy was to maximize qualifying points. How we did that was choosing the appropriate category to operate, typically a single operator, high power. Operate in the high value contests, even if it wasn't my favorite mode. And commitment. There's a lot of things that go into the commitment part of it. Most of it is keeping you, keeping your seat in the chair and uh, sticking with it, even, on, when, even under less than ideal conditions. Now, might be radio conditions or you know a bad week at work or anything but I, I can't stress that part enough about commitment after all this is our olympics that we're preparing for here's a picture i think represents the commitment level needed now driving to northern alberta through a snowstorm for a contest may not be everyone's cup of tea, but I felt it was important enough to make the trip. There were 24 qualifying contests spread over 2019 and 2020. I made it a priority to operate the high value contests like CQ Worldwide to maximize the number of qualifying points available. And at the end of all those, it's your 12 best scores that count towards your qualifying score. Here's where I spent many hours. From July 2019 to the end of 2020, I spent about 600 hours sitting in the chair, just operating qualifying contests. That doesn't include the time spent operating other events like the rack contest, sweepstakes, general operating, or things like maintenance or upgrades to this into that station. In that time, there were good contests and bad contests. But as Bill Till, the Five Fox November, told me on more than one occasion, there is no such thing as a bad contest. Some are just better than others. So let's have a quick review here. It was a two-year commitment, six hours, six hundred hours of contesting and just about 40,000 contacts went into, went into the effort. So how would we do? And I say we, because it really was a team effort. I can't say enough about the people on the ground here around me. Shelby and Quinn have many hours spent at the station. My wife, Lorianne, is the most tolerant person I know. There's also the, what I call the encouragers and uh, people like VE4EA and V6GAY were, were chief among them. As you can see, we qualified and I'm pretty proud of how we made out doing it. Looking at the Canadian results, I'm humbled to see my call sign included with these great Canadian contesters. So what happens next? Well, the first order of business is to find a teammate. Remember, this is a two person team. And then practice, practice and more practice. The first item on that list was quickly dealt with. And I'm happy to say that headed to Italy with me is John V3EJ, a seven time WRTC participant. He's achieved four top 10 finishes and is a past champion from 2006. And I don't know if I'll ever, I don't know if I'll ever understand why he agreed to go with this rookie. So the road ahead looks like this. There's less than 22 months until WRTC. 
The organizers have an awful lot of work ahead of them. Uh, John and I have many decisions to make, things to do, such as planning the equipment we're going to take, travel plans to get to Bologna, and figure out how we're going to get everything to Italy and back safely. In that time, we also need to get together and operate together and practice. It's going to be busy. It's going to be an awful lot of fun. So wish us luck. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Gilles, Victor Alpha 2 Echo Whiskey. Thanks for attending this short presentation where I'm going to share with you how it is to participate to WITC as a team leader for the second time in a row. Indeed, I was happy enough to not only be selected in 2018, but also in 2023. When thinking to the World Radio Team Championship competition, most of people are thinking about this very even playing field where every team has the same output power, the same antennas and are all working multi-two with a referee to check out that the rules are respected the whole 24 hours. But the WRTC is much more than that because before that short, relatively short 24 hour competition, we have a very long marathon of uh, two years where we are supposed to attend 24 contests and among those 24 contests only 12, the 12 best pointers are used to select you and this part of the competition, the selection process is not fair at all and not even at all so if you are a superstation in uh, Maritimes, you are close to guarantee to, to win the competition uh, compared to a modest station in Ontario. Then, when, like me, you are in a middle term, uh, I have a good station but not a super station, and I am in Quebec, which is very far from Maritimes, I have to develop a very rigorous strategy with a very small margin of error. First of all, there is what I call the background strategy. It consists in staying realistic by the fact that if a superstation is deciding to get number one, for example in the Maritimes, I cannot be number one. My only hope in this case to be number one is that this superstation will give up taking into account that it is a very long two years process and many things can happen during that piece of time. Now, if it happens that I am not number one, I know that it is very easy to be number two and then the plan B is to be number two and with that number two position, submit for a wild card. That's the idea around never give up. To illustrate that, we can have a look at the standings of 2018 selection process where North America number 7 was corresponding to East Canada area where I was competing. You can see that Jeff VY2ZM was by far the number one and with his super station uh, in the Prince Edward Island he is unbeatable not only for, the, for our area but also for most of North America. So I got the number two position and thanks to that number two position and that the fact that VY2ZM is unbeatable that gave me some munitions to persuade the, the committee, the German committee that I could be the, the wildcard number six when it happened that the African team leader was not able to reach the WRTC competition for administrative reasons. That's a very good illustration of a successful succession of events when you never give up. Now, if we have a look at the selection process for the same area now called North America number 2 for the WRTC 2023, 
we can see that apparently I win with, with an easy advance on the number 2, but this is not telling the whole story. If you have a look at the ranking, you can see on number 5, K6LA, who have a superstation in Prince Edward, VY2TT. He was the only competitor dangerous for me. And as you know, when the COVID happened, the border went closed and it was impossible for him to reach his superstation. Then for me, the horizon was clear to win the competition. While we are on this slide, uh, I can take the advantage to show you another point. Uh, you can see the number 2 VE3 AT, it's a superstation 2, but if I follow what I observed during the period, he was not willing to win the, the RTC number 1 position, he was just doing, as every year, the same contest, just to have fun with those contests. So, if you consider that the number 2 was not someone who was trying to win the number one position for WTC, that means that number three, number four were not in the mood to compete too, even if at the beginning that might have the will. May I remember anyway that for some, there are some idea that uh, someone is going to take them as a teammate, so they are not to compete as team leader. The important point for those people is just to be in the 10 first of the area to get the, the clearance to be a teammate for the Dora TC competition. Anyway, always the same ID, never give up and the opportunities are coming by themselves. So now we can get deeper into the selection process strategy. To start, we have to make a remembering of the math for the contest. So the, um, each contest is waiting between 800 and 1000 points. That's the maximum that you can earn for a given contest. And then uh, the, that maximum can be diminished by a percentage according to your category. There is no diminution for a single operator high power, but for uh, assisted you are only 95% of the maximum, and for low power and multi-single 90%. The category winner gets 100% one of his category and the other have just a percentage of this maximum. VE2XXXX at the ARRL DX gets 1 million contest points as high power assisted and VE2Y4 times 700,000 points on the same category which is only 70% of the winner score. Then the winner VE2X4 times gets 800 points for the contest times 95% for the category assisted times 100% because he is the number one. But the number two at the same value, 800 points times 95%, but times only 70% because his score is 70% of the score of the winner. So you see the first one have 760, while the second gets only 532. In a way, the contest strategy during the selection process is not that difficult. You just have to choose for each contest the category which has the highest probability to provide you the highest pointer. But that's the point. It's not that easy to determine this category. To do that, I have kind of procedure that I'm sharing with you. In the first time, I'm studying the former result during the years when the propagation conditions were roughly the same as today. Assuming that most of the competitors are the same, with the same station, the same habits, the same uh, skills, and th So we can expect that with the same condition we are going to have roughly the same results. Now, with that in hand, I try to know or guess the intended category for each serious competitor. Either I ask them, either I try to guess. Anyway, I, I want to have a good idea of who is doing what during this contest. Then I can do the math. The math are giving me the different expectation f about the score of the different uh, competitors, including myself. And then I can make a decision tree and determine my category in terms of highest probability. 
Then, a very important point, I stick to the plane. I'm not going to change at the last minute for any emotional decision. Whatever it is for some fear reason or for fun reason, I stick to the plan. To illustrate the importance of that category decision, I'm showing you three examples. First one, worked all Europe CW. If I am in the HP category, I know there are three serious participants and I'm sure that my score will be only 70% of one of those unbeatable stations. So my result is going to be only 700 WTC points. If I go low power, I have no serious participant, my score will be 100% of the category with only a discount of 10% corresponding to the 90% of the low power category. The result will be 900 points, way over the 700 points of the high power category. Second example, EARU HF. If I go HP, not assisted, I'm sure my score is going to be 80% of another super station. So I'm going to get only 760 points. Now, if I go to the assisted category, thanks to the multiplier uh, given by the cluster, I can expect to beat him, but only with the 5% discount. In this case, with 95% of the maximum score, I still have 900 and two points, which is well over 760. Third example, a bit more funny. Suppose we are at the end of the selection process, there are only three contests to go. I'm already number one, and the number two could beat me only if he have the maximum points for the three remaining contests. But I know that one operator is going to zone two, and according to the statistics, is going to scratch the score of that number 2 by 25%. In this case, I have just nothing to do. The guy in zone 2 is doing the job for me. Now that we have a seat for the final WRTC competition, we have to prepare. And first of all, we have to prepare the station. It's a kind of day expedition and field day at the same time. It's not a question to have any failure during the 24 hours of the competition, only three lost minutes are one or two places lost. Because the equipment can be either dilated, lost, shocked during the travel, we need some IBC plane and a lot of redundancy. Included in the reliability is the RFI concerns. So to deal with that, the only solution is to simulate the total station. And for that, either for the day expedition, the field days and the Dover TC, I'm just mounting a tent, like you can see on the picture, with the characteristic very close to the final WRTC tent, including the antenna system that you can see in the background. By the way, I want to thank uh, Guy Richard, VE2 Quebec Golf, our RAC QC Regional Director, for letting us using the VA2 RAC call sign during the Canada Day, the Winter and the ERU HF contests. It helps a lot our preparation as it boosts our runs while we are seriously activating the VA2 RAC call sign. It is a win-win for RAC and for us. The preparation of the strategy looks very simple in terms of ID but is very complex in terms of realization. We have just to prepare a kind of roadblock, which band, which mode, which activity, run, SNP, which antenna direction, and that for the whole 24 hour and for the two operators. That's very, very difficult to prepare in advance. The last point is the practice. We have to train as a team and we have to get more efficient to pass the mules, to check the band, to analyze the info, to choose the direction of the antenna and to adapt the run frequency according to the harmonics that we can bring to the other operator. So a lot of tries, a lot of tests during the two coming years expecting to step by step improving our efficiency as a team. A short parenthesis about the 2018 competition that I attended in Germany. Uh, it was a very special case because I had only one month to prepare with my uh, teammate, Arnaud, and by the way, that I had never ever met before. 
So our obvious main priority was to define a setup that will be 100% wearable. Then we could work on the strategy and for that we only had three days when I came in advance in Germany uh, because of the very short notice we had to prepare. But because it was the first time ever in my contest career that I could compete on a real even play field with many high level competitors, I have learned a lot. And not only during the contest itself, but also afterward by studying the logs of the other competitors and comparing their choice with ours. That was a very, very rich experience for that, that I will reuse during the next competition. The last uh, slide is about the future. I will compete with Victor, Victor Alpha 2 Whiskey Alpha. We are competing together or against each other for more than 10 years now. We well know each other. We have about similar stations uh, and that should be a plus as a team to know each other that well. We have a lot of time to prepare too and improve some weakness, so we are optimists for, for that. The most difficult for us is to anticipate the propagation from Italia and the traffic in Europe. As we could see in Germany in 2018, the European teams were a lot advantaged by the knowledge of the local propagation. And the proof is that only one non-European team was in the top 10. And in 2023, the propagation should be close to the maximum of the solar cycle, which is way different from what we are currently experimenting for years. A last important point, the Italian organizers have got a one more year delay to prepare this complex event, but the community is a bit concerned by the opacity about where they are in the process. You can be sure the Italians will feel encouraged in their difficult task when you are sending some donations at WRTC2022.it. Thank you everybody for attending my presentation. Well, that was, that was excellent. Thank you very much uh, to Gilles and also to, to Todd. That was uh, outstanding, magnifique. Uh, we now have uh, so probably a good 15 minutes, I guess, of uh, time remaining for any questions or comments from the group. Uh, you may all be muted at this point. So if you do have anything you wish to say, uh, you should have the ability to unmute yourselves and uh, go ahead. I'll try to direct traffic if there is any. Can you hear me? Okay, we just had a bit of a double there. I see Paul, um, I see you, you're unmuted. And also uh, Gabor, VE7 Juliet Hotel. Uh, which one of you would like to go first? Let Gabor go first. I <laughs> think he was before me. Okay, Gabor, go ahead, please. And unmute. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you fine. Cool. Hey, congratulations to V5MX. I came in third on that list and uh, tried my darndest, but I just couldn't beat the guy. So congrats. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Gabor. Thanks, Gabor. Paul, did you have something too? Yes, thanks. Um, you know, just a question about uh, the equipment that you use. Does everybody use basically the same equipment, the same antennas, or is it some sort of... Uh, the same general type of uh, equipment. How does it work? Uh, you, 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 the, the question is about the equipment during the WRTC itself? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. How okay. Okay. Uh, actually, usually it's a, a tri-bander for 20, 15, and 10 uh, that we are sharing uh, between the two stations with a uh, with a, a demultiplex station, you know, uh, and uh, we have a separate 40 meter dipole and 80 meter dipole. So uh, the, 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 the 80 meter dipole is very low, so it's not very, uh, very efficient. And the, the tri-bounder, you know, we, we often do that during the field days, you know, when you are 
in several stations. We are sharing a, a, a tribunder uh, with a triplexer. That's the same kind of equipment. Now about the radios, yes, it's the, just uh, the usual radios. Uh, as we don't only have 100 watts, we don't need any amplifier. So basically, it's very close to the field day equipment. You know, when you are in a, something 2, um, 2A category, for example, I think it's very close to the 2A category. You have the same kind of tent. You have the um, a generator, the same kind of generator. So. If, if you are used to, to, to do some, some field days uh, in multi-op, I think it's very close to that. Okay, but um, maybe I don't misunderstand. So basically each individual station, like you have two people, they're one, one team and you actually have, you can have two stations on the X, like two yeah, yes. field days. Exactly. You share the antennas with the diplexer. Exactly. What, what about the other teams? Where are they? Do they are they all in the same general area? Is it? Is it or how does that work? I don't understand the, the question. Well, uh, I, I, I can, uh, yeah. they're all in the same geographical area, Paul. Yeah. And uh, every station is, a, is identical. Every station has the, the identical tribander, the identical mast, the identical tent, the identical generator. The teams bring their own radios, but the, the uh, organizing committee will provide a power meter to keep you under 100 watts. So the idea being that you bring your own radios, hook them to the organizer's antennas in their tents, and this way you decide, this is the 24 hour contest, will decide who's the best under as close to uh, identical conditions as is possible. Yeah, so it's, okay, so it's, it's sort of like field day, except, um yeah are you, how far spread apart is everybody i mean is that are you very close with no 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 they are typically in germany there, there was into a circle of uh, let's say 300 kilometer diameter okay yeah, yeah that's what I, I mean i was kind of thinking initially that you all in one big field and you were uh, you, know, you have to worry about mutual <laughs> interference and stuff like that not like that yeah yes it's a uh, because the the we, we, we must not interfere yeah, okay, between okay. together. Okay. I know, okay. honestly, there, there is no any problem of, of this kind. Uh, generally, it's okay. No, if you're, if you're that far apart. Okay, no, that's fine. Interesting. Thanks. Excellent. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Yes, so if, if there are no questions, I, I could add something. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, about the, the selection process is, is very different from the, the competition itself, as I, I mentioned. Uh, it's very strange because people are, are speaking about uh, Olympics, of, uh, about the, the, of the Dura TC, but you know, it, there are different way to, to see how, what is Dura TC. So you have two, two, two extremities, you know, you, on a way, uh, as it's more easy to, to be selected when you have a big station, that maybe it's a kind of club of big station owners, you know, and then that they are doing a kind of arm fest every four years <laughs> and see who uh, be a, a month, uh, sorry, who among them is the best. But that not monetarily means that it's the best operator in the world. You know, it's just the best among the, the, the owners of big stations. And yeah? because to be selected, you, you need a big station. So now on the other side, people are dreaming of a real best operator. But amateur radio is not only operating. It's also uh, contest is not only operating. It's also making strategy, very important. And it's also mastering the technique, you know, optimizing the station. So. Uh, all that's all, all that may be took in, in, into uh, account, and so between the pure, you know, uh, the guy thinking in terms of uh, of pure pure operating, and on the other side, the, the guys who are only thinking about big station, you know, the the, the, the field the the Dora TC is a mix of that, and often you have people not not okay with. With, with who is selected, why, etc. So it's a never ending process because it's impossible to organize some mini dollar TC on each country to select the best one. 
and then the best of those should go to the WRTC at, at the world level. So it's an impossible goal to reach. So we have to, to deal with that, with, with that reality. Just uh, Chair VE6OH, I have a question. Yes, uh, Mitch, VE6OH, go ahead. Uh, so uh, I think it was Todd, I think it wasn't Todd. Someone said uh, that the stations are all within roughly a 200 kilometer uh, radius. I'm not sure there's 200 kilometers in uh, Italy. Uh, I guess the question is, uh, have the station sites been picked at this point? Uh, and if they are, have they released where they're going to be? Oh. The last, uh, the last event I attended online, they had about half of them selected, Mitch, and uh, basically it uh, triangle from Bologna north to uh, Ferrara, I believe, and and then west to Modena. There's kind of a triangle there in the Po River Valley, and that's uh, that's where it's generally going to be. Okay, sounds good. <clears throat> so it's mostly in the north part then, correct? That's right, all northern Italy. Okay, great. Kerry, uh, uh, VE4EA has his hand up. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, can hear you fine. Part. Great. Um, great presentations to everybody and congratulations to uh, both of our champions and our um, rep representatives. I have to apologize to Gabor for making that trip to Weyburn, Saskatchewan to encourage Todd to get started and affecting all our chances. But I think uh, uh, you'll agree that we have a, uh, a, a, wonderful, a wonderful champion of representing us in 2023. Um, I, I want to, it hasn't been said, but this is a, this is basically, it's a world ham fest and it's a wonderful networking opportunity um, to meet people who um, love radio sport as much as, as we do. And um, I attended uh, in 2018 as a visitor, as a guest, and it was, it was amazing. It was almost a week's worth of, of ham fest, of amateur activities before the, uh, the, the actual uh, event takes place over uh, on a Saturday from, I believe it starts 1200, is it 1200 Zulu, John, or is that correct? Um, and um, that's a 24 hour period with events before and uh, certainly well after. So I'd encourage anybody who can make it. Um, there are programs for spouses, and it's um, it's really a wonderful um, a wonderful vacation time in uh, in Bologna, which is uh, the home of all the high speed. Well, first of all, it's the home of Marconi, um, and also all the uh, um, the famous uh, the race cars. Um, of Italy. So that's it. If you can make it, if you're, uh, if you're available, book that week off. It's the IARU weekend and um, uh, maybe you can even find a station to operate while you're over there. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yes, uh, I can. Uh... That, that's true, uh, Kerry. Thank you to remember us that because us as a competitor, we are focused on competition. <laughs> but that's true. Uh, yes, it's a wonderful weekend, or a wonderful week for us because we, we meet everybody in the world. Uh, we have a very interesting discussion. We are, uh, we are creating real link, you know, between people. That, that, that's a very fun event, you know, very, very pleasant event. Uh, but of course, People are, are personally as a competitor. I, I, I leave that not as uh, as cool as, for example, a referee or a visitor. Because when you are a competitor, just just pass the border with the the radios in the luggage. You know, uh, just pass the the security at the airport with the radio. Uh, you know, I, I see some some guys. 
you know, surrounded by police because I don't know what was thinking of the <laughs> the guy checking the luggage, <laughs> but you know, it's a, a bit of stress for us to bring all the equipment uh, safe at, at the Dura TC. So we we are uh, as a competitor, I, I feel more stressed as if I were just a visitor or or, or a referee. The, the referee can come the, the end in pockets. Uh, that's not the case of, of competitors. So maybe more experienced uh, competitor like John, uh, for them it's a kind of uh, use, but for, for us it's, it, it's not obvious. Very good, Jill, thank you. Uh, Gabor? I was just gonna say that I totally echo Carrie's sentiments about taking part in these things. I was able to go to the Morse code world high speed telegraphy world championships back in Hungary a couple of years back. And though I had no chance of winning anything, it was super cool to meet all those guys. And I probably handed out a dozen QSL cards to uh, people that I actually worked before. Uh, also taking part in the uh, Vimy. I see a couple of guys are here for TM100 Vimy. Hi guys. And uh, it's really nice to see all these Canadian contesters in a group here. I think we should do it at least once a year. Very good. We, uh, we're running up. We have about uh, four minutes left before the room automatically will close on us. So if you have anything further to say, any of you, we, we could maybe expedite that. And uh, if not, we'll thank our presenters, Jill and Todd, and those who made uh, comments and interventions as well. One final pause, I guess, for any uh, final comment from anybody. Okay, just a last word, if you permit. Uh, just want to mention that it's a long time since we did not add two full Canadian teams going to the event you know uh, it's a long time since so i think it's a good opportunity for us canadians to put canada again on the map with the double rtc okay thanks joe carrie go ahead can you tell that i wish i was going as a competitor i have lots to say um uh, the the I object is for WRTC to move from one continent to the other, um, basically from Europe back to the Western Hemisphere. And um, this past, uh, the past selection year in 2018, there, the only proposal came from Italy and it meant two years in a row. The, the question came up, to, to me and I imagine other uh, VE, VEs, uh, why doesn't somebody in Canada host this? Well, the first, there's, there's all kinds of logistical um, objections, which is, uh, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a complicated and uh, wonderful uh, nightmare uh, that takes, uh, takes two years to prepare, or no, four years to prepare. Um, and the, the logical place for something to happen in Canada would be VE3. Um, and that's because of, um, we could find a relatively um, a level plane to, um, to have all these uh, 60 some odd stations. Yes, I know they exist in VE4, but we wouldn't want to uh, impose our propagation on uh, the rest of the world. So it has to be somewhere in VE2 or VE3. Um, and um, I'm just basically throwing it out there. It's got to be presented to, um, I think, a board of trustees for voting on. Um, there needs to be a leader uh, or a team, a committee formed. And... Uh, the, the parties in question may not be um, on the chat this evening, but uh, just something to talk about um, so that uh, we can bring it back. It's got to be on one of the coasts, and it's time for the East Coast, and it's never been in Canada. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Carrie. Just have a one-minute warning from Trish. So go ahead, Mitch. Your hand's up. Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. One, I guess the first question is, and this is probably a huge financial expense for those that are going over there and i'm wondering if there's any provisions to uh, 
somehow support them from some of the other groups around. That's uh, one comment. And if it is, maybe it could be stuck on the end of the video or sent out uh, in a rack bulletin or something of that nature. And second, I think we should subject them to our crappy propagation way up north. So we should stick them all the way up into the Northwest Territories. Then they'll know what real contesting is like, right? That's all I have to say, seven three. Right. With or without Muskeg. <laughs> seven three, everybody.